All right. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn to 2 Corinthians. We'll get there in just a minute. This table is much smaller once you're uh, placing things on it than it is. Uh... I don't know if this is the one we usually use for prayer, but it feels like uh, the Grinch is hard. It is ten, ten times too small. <laughs> oh. Luckily, Matt's going to throw all the verses up for me when I get to him anyhow, so I won't need my Bible. Well, I want to share a little bit before we get into the, the passage, and I want to, those of you that have been tracking with us over the summer, we've been doing a series called Church in the Wild, and uh, Pastor Lee and, and a few other speakers have been taking us entirely through the book of 2 Corinthians, and so for the simulcast, it ended last week with Pastor Zach, but uh, for those of you that are physically in downtown Kalamazoo this morning, you're getting a bonus week of Church in the Wild, and I want to share just a few of my thoughts on the the thing from 2 Corinthians that stood out to me over the summer and then specifically Paul's farewell address at the end. But before I get into that, I want to just take a time and share a little bit of my own personal story. I was just praying this week and uh, just processing with my wife some and just feeling like, man, we're here, we're new. Those of you that uh, haven't joined us before, we, we moved here in June from Kansas City and I've been loving Michigan, getting to know the, the water wonderland. We're anxiously awaiting the winter wonderland that's coming, and so we're, we love Michigan summer, we are eagerly looking forward to Michigan fall, and we are uh, in deep travail for what could happen in Michigan winter, so pray for us. I feel like you get like two extremes, you always get like the horror stories of like, oh yeah, Michigan's great for like these three months, and then uh, good, good luck, you know, or it's the people who, like, love Michigan, they're like, are you kidding me, it's, like, the most gorgeous place in the world, and there's snow everywhere, and you have to go up north, and so a lot of doom and gloom, and a lot of glory and pride in the state of Michigan, and so we'll see what end of the spectrum we end up on. Somebody just come check on us in February, see how we're doing, um, check on my wife especially, because not only will she be cooped up in the house, but she'll be stuck with me, so it's kind of a double, double uh, persecution that she has to endure there. But uh, yeah, just as we were sharing, processing, I was like, man, I want to just take some time and share a little bit of just who I am, get, let you get to know me a little bit, a little bit of my story. I grew up in the backwoods of eastern Ohio, very close to West Virginia. And uh, <clears throat> let's give it up for Devin, too, wearing a Royals jersey this morning. Like, that's, come on. That's, I'm from Kansas City. I've been a Royals fan. My first year in Kansas City, the Royals lost over 100 games. Tickets were like $4. And so you could go watch a Royals game cheaper than you could, like, have McDonald's. But then as Allie and I dated, got married, were engaged, the Royals got very good for, like, three years, but were very poor, small baseball clubs, so much more lucrative teams stole all of our good players. But those couple of years, man, before everybody signed big contracts everywhere else, we got to go to World Series and really, really enjoy the Kansas City Royals. And so that was a real blessing to come in and just, you know, see that powder blue on the stage this morning. Thank you. Well, as I said, I grew up in, in the, the country of eastern Ohio. A bunch of my family's from West Virginia that moved over, and then the rest of my family grew up in that area. A little town called Lakeland is where my dad and my grandpa are from because there's this tiny little town and then like five lakes that border it. And so the high school and the town, it's, it's all called Lakeland. <clears throat> and it's really in the middle of nowhere, like things that you just probably can't imagine if you grew up in the city, like... Uh, was not uncommon to show up to school and there'd be like more tractors in the parking lot than there were like cars or bicycles. Like, like literally several kids from the farms nearby would just drive a tractor, and like hop off, go to church or go to school. Um, they gave us the first two days of deer season off every year, like as like actual holidays. Like if you, if it was the Monday after Thanksgiving is deer season in Ohio. And if you don't show up to school that Monday and Tuesday after Thanksgiving, you could literally just give the teacher a note like, yeah, I was deer hunting. Like, oh, yeah, of course. Like, totally excused absence. Uh, I remember uh, the times of uh, putting plastic, thick, like, industrial plastic in the back bed of a pickup truck and unhooking the hose from a hot water heater, filling that bad boy up, boom, hot tub. Pick up, pick up truck, hot tub. Um, I was very close with my grandparents, my dad's parents. Um, they were uh, Methodist pastors my whole childhood and then later planted a non-denominational church. They were really influential in my life, um, especially in those later years after I got saved. I'll get to that part here in a minute. But uh, if you have praying grandparents, man, we're kindred spirit. I'm so thankful for my grandparents. My grandpa passed away this last September. 
Uh, it was like a very mile marking season in my life. He was precious to me and my grandma, his wife is still alive. She's in North Carolina and she's no joking, one of my dearest friends. If I were to list my three or four closest friends in my life, my grandma would be one of those. We talk on the phone often, and we share books that we're reading and movies we're watching and talk about the Lord, and uh, just they're a treasure to me. And so <clears throat> I'm going to just share that as I get into my story. My parents got divorced when I was two. I don't have any memories of my parents together. And growing up, you know, I had these Methodist pastors I had a couple parents that were, you know, trying, but they were in very, uh, just to be gracious toward them, very difficult seasons of their life. And uh, as a kid, I had this, just these experiences of extremely high highs and extremely low lows. I don't know if any of you can resonate with, like, you got, maybe feel like you got, somebody asked you your testimony, you're like, I got saved, like, 17 times, <laughs> like, every summer youth camp, and then I went back to school, and it was like, I don't, I don't know if I'm really saved, but, but it was these, these moments of, like, I'd go to a, a youth conference, or, you know, my Grandparents would talk my mom into sending me into some church summer camp or something or whatever, and I'd have, you know, who, who in here remembers Acquire the Fire back in the day? They're like, let's go. And Promise Keepers, I would, I would end up in all these, like, you know, events, and my heart would burn. I'd be like, man, I want to give everything for Jesus, and then not think about it, you know, for the next 18 months of my life as I would go back to my just life and school and friendships, and, uh, yeah, extremely low lows, uh, very given to sin and brokenness pretty much in every way that you can imagine. And uh, my senior year of high school, I'm uh, my, my dad's side, he had a place in Mexico, and we would go to Mexico every year. And I'm <clears throat> just kind of at the peak of my rebellion, running from the Lord. I'd actually moved out of my mom's house into my dad's house because the rules were even less strict. And I knew basically I can live high school however I want. And it uh, was just doing that, very much so, taking advantage of all those liberties, <clears throat> let the reader understand. And I'm in Mexico, living, you know, this kind of unsupervised life as a 17-year-old idiot, and uh, making very, very poor decisions. And uh, it's the the day we're getting ready to go home, um, you know, we're getting ready to leave, we're packing up our hotel room, I'm, you know, getting ready, maybe going to grab a shower, pack my bag, whatever, before we head to the airport. And this just like gnawing, I'm not okay thing just starts to rest on me. Like, you know, it's when you hit that place of like, you're telling people that like you're, you're doing great. Like, I'm, I'm crushing it. I'm playing high school basketball and I'm getting good grades. I got a cute girlfriend. Like, everything's awesome. And inside, you know, like, I am not okay. And, uh, it had been growing throughout the years of high school, but it was just at a place, you know, um, and I get on the flight, we're flying back home, and I have, like, you know, the classic, like, CD player with the headphones, and, you put your, and I'm digging through my bag, I can't find any, nothing to listen to, no CDs, I got this flight all the way back from Mexico, and I'm just, like, looking, and I pull out, there's one CD, like, down on the bottom, and it's, like, Mercy Me, that, uh, the, the, the band from the early 2000s, you know, I can only imagine guy. And I'm like, what is this trash, you know? Like, I'm like, I don't want, because I'm not saved, you know? And some of you, even if you are, that's not great, you know, audio entertainment option. But uh, for me at that time, especially, it's like, I'm not, I'm not listening to this. And so I'm looking, I'm uh, just looking, nothing, it's the only CD I have, which I'm like, I don't know how that's even possible. I must have, like, left them all in the hotel room or something, lost my little... And I don't even know how that one got in there. Grandma probably, like, snuck it into my backpack or something. <laughs> but, uh, and I'm on the plane. I'm just so bored, like, an hour in. I'm like, whatever, you know. So I throw the CD on and listen to it and just bawling, like, the whole flight home. And it kind of kick-started this series of events for the sake of time that culminates in me. Um, it was, like, around the late fall, winter time. And uh, about a month or so later, I'm at a Christmas Eve service at, at this church in town. Not, not even the church that I went to. I don't even, I think I went with a random family member or a friend or something, and I end up at this Christmas Eve service. And uh, my grandma, growing up, she memorized Luke chapter 2. In every Advent season, she would quote Luke chapter 2 from memory at our church. It was like this memory I had, like, or, you know, for you in the city of David, a Savior is born. And she would, she would quote the whole story of the Magi and the shepherds culminating in Luke 2 where, he, you know, he's called Jesus the Savior. <clears throat> and... Uh, I get to this Christmas Eve service, and the guy's preaching out of Luke chapter 2, and it just triggers, like, you know, all these childhood memories. It wasn't even that good of a message. Now, looking back, I'm like, man, that guy was not a great preacher, but it doesn't always take great rhetorical 
efforts to cause the Holy Spirit to touch a person's heart. And he's preaching out of Luke chapter 2, and he's highlighting on the emphasis of, of Jesus' name there, Savior, and it literally means one who rescues or delivers. It's a rescuer. And uh, his main point was there are some of you that are in desperate need of rescuing this morning. And I remember, you know, giving my life to Jesus. The next uh, few weeks, I actually ended up telling my parents, which is like a super hard conversation in our family, that, hey, I'm going to have to actually move out of our house. I want to go live with Grandma and Grandpa and uh, just, like, go all out on this, like, church, because they lived across the street from the church. They pastored the church. I was like, I just, I want to go all in on this, like, Jesus thing. And they were, like, understanding but hurt, and it caused all kinds of family drama. And you know, I'm, like, angsty teenager. I'm looking at all those passages, like, I came to turn a mother and father because, you know, I'm like, I'm suffering for the gospel of Jesus. Like, but in my own real way, it was real. It was this family tension, painful conversations. I have great relationship with all of my family now. So if you're, like, worried that that severed my relationship with my dad forever, it didn't. We're great. We go hunting and fishing all the time. Visit them in Florida. Looking forward to that when Michigan is freezing this February. Go see him in Tampa. Um, <clears throat> but I give my life to Jesus, move in with them, and that aspect of being rescued just comes to the, I knew instantly that I was called to ministry. I think I knew for many years before that, but I was trying to run away from it. And I just go full send the complete opposite direction. And I'm reading my Bible all through study hall, all when I get home from school. I'm going to like Wednesday night choir practice, Bible studies, I mean everything that I'm hanging out with like 50 year old church ladies and I'm like a 17 year old kid. But it changed my life. And I fell in love with two things. The Bible just became fascinating to me in that season. And I gained this deep love and appreciation for the word. And I fell in love with the local church and just being around God's people, being in the presence of other believers and just the way that they talk, the way that they relate to one another, the things that, things that they're about really changed the course of my life forever. And uh, I feel like Really, my history with the Lord since has been that same theme. I, uh, I got saved then, but I didn't get sanctified instantly. And it took uh, some of the years of Bible college and even the couple of years after of being delivered and rescued. And, uh, yeah, just a testimony of, you know, I went to Bible school, moved to Kansas City to do a missions program, and then ended up staying in a ministry there uh, for the last 12 years. Met my wife there, had our kids there, and... The first several years, it was mostly being rescued out of the work of my own hands, like disasters that I'm causing for myself that the Lord delivered me out of. But then building a testimony of seeing him deliver us out of hard situations where we had attack coming against us or financial situation where there was lack. And that history of a 17-year-old boy that needed rescued by Jesus produced a faith as I grew in maturity that the Lord could deliver me out of any situation. And so... That's a little bit about me. Um, ask me any question, any conversation. Invite us over for dinner. We will come. We will bring our children. It will be chaos, but we can promise a good time. And so if you want to hear more of our, our story. All right, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, the very end. want to spend the time that we have left this morning in the scripture. I love this book, man. It's been a, it's been a really good summer being in, in 2 Corinthians. And if you've kind of missed the, uh, the kind of theme, it should be fairly obvious, but Church in the Wild, it's taking Paul's letter to the church in Corinth and the application points that he's making to that church in this secular environment, in this wicked city, um, and many of the, the speakers over the summer, they've shared of the various aspects of the city of Corinth. But the, the phrase, church in the wild, it's taking those application points that Paul's making in his letter to the church in Corinth and drawing how applicable they are for the church in America today. So we are the church in the wild. Surprise, if you, if you missed that throughout the 15 sessions this summer. We're the church in the wild, and there's so many parallels to the church in Corinth, to the church in America today. We really do live my opinion, in a post-Christian nation. We live in a secular environment. I think America is basically the, the most, like, biblical comparison, I would say, is probably Babylon. Like, there's just a 
wickedness really throughout the government, throughout the educational system, throughout social media, marketing, like pretty much the entire thing exists to exploit you and get your money, get your attention, get your affection. Um, there's not a whole lot of this influencing the things that America runs on. It runs on more than Duncan's. It runs on all kinds of uh, wickedness. And uh, so, man, I I love that because Paul's writing to believers in that kind of context. He's writing to believers that are facing those kind of challenges, that are living in that kind of environment. And as we've been moving through this book, I would encourage you, even if you're just starting out in your Christian life, go back and listen to some of that series this summer. Go back and look through 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. There are so many just tangible application points that Paul's making to the church in Corinth that are so relatable to our lives today as believers. <clears throat> and uh, I want to look just at his uh, scholars call it the Trinitarian farewell address. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 14. And uh, it's just basically Paul's goodbye, his farewell address to this letter. And I think a lot of times we think of a farewell address as like, uh, you know, we the greetings, the benedictions, the genealogies, we kind of think of them as like these little inconsequential little splotches, you know, in between all the real meaty, heavy stuff. And I really don't think that that's true at all. First off, because all of Scripture is God-breathed, it's beneficial, it's sharper than a two-edged sword, and so there's, there's got to be fruit and meaning and sustenance to, to all of Scripture, But secondly, I think Paul, especially in some of these places, he's not just giving a trite, like, bless you guys, love you, have a good day. Like, he's actually many times, and and a lot of scholars confirm this, many times in his greetings and in his benedictions, he's taking main themes from the entirety of his letters, and he's wrapping them up in like a short, simple phrase or sentence. Like, grace to you and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ isn't just like a cliche, cheesy Christian greeting, Paul's communicating something that he wants to release to the church. And I think that's very true in his, in his farewell address here. He's saying these few phrases, in my opinion, as a real summation of his main application points to the church in Corinth. And if I were to sum it up in my own words, I think he's saying, hey, you're living in a godless environment, but you're being called to the assignment of the church, and the answer for that disconnect is the gospel. I think that's, in essence, what Paul is saying here in verse 14 in his farewell address. You're living in a godless environment, but you have this grand assignment to be the body of Christ, to be the church, to do Ephesians 4, to equip the believers for the work of ministry, to be the representation of Jesus in the flesh and the earth. You're in a godless environment. You have this lofty assignment, and the answer is the gospel. So let's look at it. He says these three just awesome phrases. He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And again, the reason many scholars call that Paul's Trinitarian farewell address is because he's basically inviting them in to the fellowship of the Trinity as a blessing that he's pronouncing over them. So it's a, it's a blessing over the church in Corinth and it's an invitation, and the same applies to us. He's saying the grace of Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And he's blessing them and he's inviting them. And I think um, he's, he's making a, a statement again that the gospel really is the response to his invitations throughout the entirety of the book. And I'm gonna flip back to 2 Corinthians chapter five, if you will, because I think that's where Paul, again, my opinion, makes his, his main, uh, where he unpacks that reality more of the work of the gospel and how it changes us to be able to fulfill the assignment that he's calling the church to throughout both this book and 1 Corinthians as well. <clears throat> but in 2 Corinthians chapter five, Pick up in verse, uh, let's go 17. <clears throat> and again, we're going to come back to those, those three Trinitarian invitations. <clears throat> He's saying, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, my old uh, grandpa, growing up in the Methodist Church, he said, if, you, if there's a therefore, you've got to see what it's there for. So you got to. 
wish Devin was on the drums right there to give me a little, you know. <clears throat> therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and, and the therefore really is, he's saying because of what he just talked about, and he's talking about the sacrifice of Jesus, what Jesus accomplished on the cross. He's saying, therefore, because of that which he accomplished, and then after he goes out of what Jesus accomplished and says, you're going to stand before the Lord, there's going to be a judgment seat that you stand before the Lord at. He goes, because of these things, because of what Jesus accomplished, and because you're ultimately going to give account and stand before the Lord, because of those things, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, new things have come. All of this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he was entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we're ambassadors for Christ, making his appeal through us. And we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Because it was for our sake that he made him, Jesus, to become sin, though he knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for the giving of your son. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the truths of your word. We thank you that they're meant to be living and active that they're meant to have entrance into our mind and into our hearts, and they're meant to produce fruit on the inside and fruit on the outside. And we ask you that as we look at your word and talk about your word and think about your word this morning, that the gospel would do what it's always been intended to do, and it would transform us, that it would change the way we think, that it would change the way we feel, that it would ultimately change the way that we live. We thank you for this good news, this glorious news of your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. What I want to kind of do by looking at these two passages is to push past some of the hurdles in Christian language and take away some of the real simple realities of the gospel. And I feel like as the church, we often kind of fall into two camps, if I can kind of oversimplify it a little bit. Either Christian language is so foreign to us that we can't actually get to the entry point. You know, we have the like scholarly language of like, what is penal substitutionary atonement? Like, what is, you know, imputed righteousness? And we have these phrases like, uh, with, there's just an assumption of like, I can't even relate with that language. And so we never even make it to the entry point. Or we have the other challenge. It's so over familiar that we've lost the substance. It's words like grace and reconciliation and the gospel. They're such, you know, Christian buzzwords, and they're so familiar that we've lost the substance that's contained in them. And I'm really asking the Lord that we would just take some of these phrases, and he would help us, by his spirit, get through both hurdles, that we would fall in between, that we would fall in that place of the reason that the word gospel is such a buzzword or grace is used so often is because it communicates such a powerful truth that's meant to influence the way in which the believer thinks, feels, and ultimately lives. And uh, I think it's imperative that we push past some of those mindsets, not just in a Sunday morning message like this, but on a regular basis. The, the scripture really is truth. If you believe that the scripture is, is truth, just raise your hand this morning. If you believe that it's powerful, if you believe, as it even says in its own contents, that it's beneficial for reproof, it's, it's like a sword that separates bone from marrow and word from spirit. And the Old Testament in Psalms, he says that the entrance of his word, it brings light and understanding to all. And if that's true, then we have to be able to think about the things in which it communicates and make them applicable to our own lives. And I think it's important to remember that the scripture wasn't really given to mostly be unpacked by preachers or scholars, certainly not theologians from the West. If you think, if those phrases are true, if the scripture's meant to be living and active and beneficial, if it is the truth and the authority that we're meant to live by, it was given to all humanity throughout all generations, 
And most of humanity throughout the ages is mostly poor, illiterate, from third world countries. There are millions and billions more farmers and impoverished and those that are illiterate than there are like fuller seminary graduates in the earth. Like the scripture's not meant to be this thing that's so hard to attain and so hard to unpack that's meant for preachers and theologians to translate for us. It was given to mostly the poor, the under-resourced, the illiterate, the uneducated. It was given to all men and it's meant to have influence on all men. And so because of that, let's, let's look at some of these phrases. The first is that he says that we would partake of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I think that's what he's unpacking here in the verses we just read in 2 Corinthians 5. And grace, again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go a little bit Bible school on you here, hit some of these phrases. Let's push past the, the tuning out and the overfamiliarity and think about some of these concepts. Grace is really a twofold gift to the believer. The word grace that's used there is the, is the Greek word charis. And Paul actually uses this word over a hundred times in, in his, just in his New Testament letters alone. So just in the letters of Paul, this word grace, or the Greek word charis, is, is used over a hundred times. That's a lot. I don't know if you know that. hundred is a lot of things. It's, it's a big number. And uh, I think the reason is, I think Paul kind of sums up in Acts chapter 20, Luke writes the book of Acts, but it's Paul speaking in this instance in Acts chapter 20. And Paul says this phrase, I'm just going to summarize because I don't, can't remember the exact quote, but he's, he's saying basically I, I've come to the end of my ministry and I don't count my own reputation or my own accomplishments to be anything. He goes, but I, I just ask that I would finish well, that I would do well in this assignment. And then he says this phrase, that I would preach the gospel of grace or many translations say that I would preach the gospel of the grace of God. And the, the gospel of grace, that even that word grace there, it has this twofold blessing. It's, it's imputed righteousness and it's imparted righteousness. In other words, Paul's saying this grace, which literally means unmerited favor, or it can also mean an, an, an inclin, inclination or a leaning towards, he's saying there's something that's true about you because of this grace, and there's something that's available to you because of this grace. It's this twofold invitation. Something has become true about you, and something is available to you because of 2 Corinthians 5, because you became a new creation. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Because the Father in Jesus reconciled you to himself. And so when Paul's saying, I want you to partake of the grace of Jesus Christ, or may the grace of Jesus Christ, before he goes into the love of God, be upon you. He's saying, I want you to be a partaker or a recipient of the gospel of grace. I want you to remember that Jesus accomplished something for you that you could not accomplish on your own. That's the beauty of the new birth. Nobody ever goes to the hospital. We have three children. I was there for all three of their births, praise the Lord. And, uh, nobody uh, came into the hospital room after Noah, our oldest, was born. There was no nurses or family members that walked in and picked Noah up and was like, wow, how, how did you do it, little guy? Like, you're amazing. Like, that must have been so challenging for you. Like, you were, like, in there, and then you weren't. Like, good job. Like, no, nobody does that. Like, they celebrate the gift of the child, but they, they praise and laud the mother. She's the one who accomplished something. It's like, you are a superhero. Like, I don't, I don't even know what to do. Just let me wash dishes and clean the house. Like, whatever you need for the next, like, three weeks. It's on me. Like, I, I got you. Like, because it's incredible. Like, to watch the work of birthing something, it is incredible. And that's why it's called the new birth. We didn't accomplish anything. Like, something happened to you. Someone accomplished something on your behalf. You're the baby in the scenario. Like Jesus and the Father, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, he's, he's doing something in Jesus on the cross. He's accomplishing a new reality. That's why he calls you a new creation. He's accomplishing something that's now true about you, and he's making things available to you. Again, that twofold invitation of grace. It's imputed righteousness, something that's now true, and it's imparted righteousness, or it's, it's an 
inclination towards you. Paul goes, I want you, as you're living in a godless generation and a godless society, to partake of the gospel of grace. Remember that things are true about you now because of Jesus. Remember that things are available to you now because of Jesus. And then the second thing he goes into, he says that you would experience the love of the Father. And I, meant these, I think these things are meant to build upon each other. He goes, I want you to partake of the gospel of grace so that you can experience the love of the Father. And he's saying what Jesus did, what he accomplished, it's many things. We could do a 10-week class on all those things, but we don't have time this morning. He's saying what one of those things that Jesus did is he reconciled you to the Father in him. And he's using that language, and he uses it a lot in Ephesians chapter 1. Paul wrote both letters. And he's saying this phrase over and over and over again, in him, in Jesus, in Christ. And he's, he's presenting this reality that one of the things that Jesus accomplished for you is that when the Father looks upon you, he looks upon you in Jesus Christ. This morning, if you've been born again, the Father is able to approve you to the same measure and degree that he approves his own beloved son. He's able to affirm you to the same degree that he affirms his beloved son. He's able to show affection toward you. That's why in Ephesians 1, he says all these phrases that are like actually offensive if we say them out loud, like holy and blameless, like righteous in him. He says it at the very end of this even chapter that we're in, 2 Corinthians 5, he says, he made Christ who knew no sin to become sin that you might become something, you might become that new creation, that you might become the righteousness of God. And we're meant to think upon the truths of the gospel so that we can experience appropriately the love that the Father has for us. How many of you know that something can be true about you? That doesn't necessarily mean that you experience it all the time. A child can be adopted. They can be brought into the family. You can have them in the family pictures and put them up on the wall. You can buy them presents at Christmas. You can do everything out of the benevolence of your heart and your affection toward that child to fully adopt them. That doesn't mean they feel like they belong. And the same is true of the gospel. Paul's going, when something's true about you and you live as though it's not true about you, that's called condemnation. And he goes, I don't want you to live in condemnation. He goes, I want you to actually live and feel in the way that is true. I want you to get out of self-pity and self-condemnation and shame, and I want you to experience the affection of the Father. He goes, may may you receive the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and experience the love of the Father, because when you think about these truths, when you read verses like 2 Corinthians 5, and you say, wow, this is true? Like Jesus did something I couldn't do, and by faith I'm in him, and I'm a partaker of grace on the inside and grace on the outside, that means that the Father is approving of me the way that he approves of Jesus. <clears throat> and then he goes into this third thing that I think is, is key. We're gonna probably finish here, Olivia, I don't know if you wanna come up. <clears throat> he says, I want you to partake of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to experience the love of the Father. And then he says, I want you to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. I want you to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Again, moving through the the progression of 2 Corinthians 5, he says that you're a new creation, that he's reconciled you to himself through Jesus, that what he's accomplishing on the cross is, is reconciling you to himself. He's not counting your trespasses against you, and he's he's saying all this in reference to this, this verse at the very beginning. He says, Behold, old things have passed away and new things have come. And one of the new things that have come is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he's saying when you become a a partaker or recipient of the gospel of grace, one, something now is true about you. You're righteous. It's like showing up at the court case and like you're looking at your track record and you're like, yep, I actually committed all of those crimes. And you're standing there and he goes, uh, hey, actually, Jesus, who's perfect and spotless, I'll just judge you on behalf of his track record instead of your own. It's like, great deal, I'll take that. But that really is the gospel. It's the father looking at the track record of Jesus. This is where the word imparted comes or imputed. He's taking the track record of Jesus and he's 
he's imparting it to you, or he's allowing him to atone for what you've done, or he's allowing it to be a, a substitutionary atonement. He's, he's saying, I'll take the life that Jesus lived and the righteousness that Jesus possesses and the sacrifice that Jesus accomplished, and I'll actually apply it to you, and I'll reckon to you that way if you'll confess and be born again. And he goes, because of that, old things have passed away and new things have come. And he goes, you can experience the same love of the Father that Jesus experiences. And he goes, and one of the new things that comes is this constant reminder living on the inside of you called the Holy Spirit. And he goes, I want you to fellowship with him. I want to invite you to stand. We have a prayer team that's going to come up. They're happy to pray with you every Sunday. If you're feeling a heavy burden or you need someone to stand with you in the place of prayer, we always want to, to make room and, and be available for that. And <clears throat> You can come up at any time. But I want to specifically invite you to respond to this glorious blessing that Paul prays over us and this invitation that Paul invites us into. And it's the invitation of the gospel. And if this morning you're not born again, and you're going, man, all of that sounds incredible, but I've not trusted in Jesus. I want to experience the love of the Father. I want to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. I want old things to go away and new things to come. You can be a new creation this morning if you put your faith in Jesus Christ. I just invite you, if you're, if you're feeling that, you go, man, I, I need to give my life to Jesus. I'll just invite you to put your hand up this morning. And then many of us, because the gospel is, is this invitation, we are saved, we're delivered from our sin and, and from eternity and hell. We're being saved, and we will be saved. It's called salvation, sanctification, and glorification. There's, there's this invitation in the scripture, we're saved, but we're also being saved, but we're also gonna be saved. And Paul's saying, hey, that in between, the gospel's still the answer. And, and many of you, if you find yourself in a, in a heightened way, like Corinth, you go, man, I, I feel it every day at my job. I feel it every day in my work relationships. I feel it every day in my family. I feel it in the school board I work on. I feel it in the company that I'm at. I'm so aware that I'm in a godless environment. I need the gospel. I wanna pray for you this morning. I just invite you to respond to the Lord however you feel best. Put your hands out before him. Just begin to say little phrases to the Holy Spirit. This is Paul's invitation. This is Jesus' invitation. That we would partake of the gospel of grace. That we would be recipients of it. That you would receive of the work that Jesus accomplished. We just declare the truth over you this morning from the scripture. Old things have passed away. New things have come. God, through the sacrifice of his son, he reconciled you to himself. And you're meant to partake of that. You're meant to read it and say it and think about it often. The gospel is meant to be experienced over and over and over. It's good news. It's the declaration of good news. Jesus, we disagree with that news this morning. We say that it's good. Thank you for atoning for us. Secondly, you're meant to experience the love of the Father. You're meant to feel the approval that Jesus purchased. You're meant to feel the affirmation that Jesus purchased. You're, you're meant to feel, like Ephesians 1 says, holy and blameless, accepted in the beloved. And if you don't feel that way this morning, I just invite you to apply the gospel to your emotions. And declare the truth. I am loved by the Father. He approves of me. He affirms me. I'm accepted in the beloved. He accepts the sacrifice of his beloved son. And he relates to me on the basis of it. And lastly, we're meant to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. 
And I would just invite you this morning, also in these coming weeks, invite the conversation with the Holy Spirit where it's grown stagnant. Holy Spirit, we want to fellowship with you. We want to receive the things that Jesus purchased, amongst which you are chief. He says so himself in John 14 and John 16. It's to our benefit. He purchased the ability to receive you, and he gave you as a gift that we might fellowship with you. It says in that section in John 14, 16, it says it a few different ways, but specifically one of the verses, he says that he'll take the things that belong to Jesus and he'll disclose them or he'll, he'll reveal them to your spirit. Holy Spirit, we invite you to do that. Talk to us about the gospel. Talk to us about the cross. Remind our weary souls of the blood that was shed. Remind our hearts and our minds that we're beloved by our Father. We want to fellowship with you, Holy Spirit. It's the only way to make it. It's the only way to make it is to be partakers of your grace, to experience the love of the Father, and to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. We love you, Jesus. Amen.